All right. Uh, well, it's three minutes past 10. Uh, I have quite a bit to get through uh, in the next hour or so. So uh, let's get started. Uh, just uh, a few housekeeping points, uh, first of all, just to flag that this session is being recorded. Um, we will send out a, uh, a, a, a copy of the recording plus the slides um, in the next few days. So probably after the weekend, realistically. Uh, so don't don't feel panicked that you have to take copious notes. Uh, you can you can sit back, relax, and and, and listen to me uh, waffling on, uh, and then the notes and recording will follow uh, in the next few days. But do bear that in mind that there is uh, opportunity for um, posting uh, questions in the Q and A box, um, and uh, if there are uh, things that you perhaps regret sharing at a later date, uh, do bear in mind that the fact that this is being recorded uh, and uh, in theory, will be available uh, forever. So uh, do do bear that in mind before popping anything embarrassing in the Q and A or the chat box. Um, chat box, uh, uh, please try and use that really just for um, technical issues. If you if you are having any technical uh, issues, do, uh, uh, do 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 message uh, VWV plus events. Uh, my colleague Tamar there will um, uh, hopefully be able to resolve those for you. Um, and as I say, we've got the Q and A. Uh, box available. Uh, you won't be able to see the questions that you've posted or that others have posted uh, until uh, I click a, a button. So, so don't feel that you're shouting uh, into a, a bottomless void uh, if you're posting questions and I haven't answered them. I'll, I'll try and deal with questions at the end rather than as we go along. But uh, let's 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 see how that goes. If if I spot a question that uh, means I've said something wrong or suggests to me that I've said something wrong or, or something very confusing, then I'll I'll try and pick that up. Uh, uh, during the course of the session. Right, uh, as I say, a few things to, to uh, try and cover this morning. Um, just to flag as well that this is a primary, where this session really is uh, almost entirely looking at uh, student visa uh, issues uh, and, and child student visa issues for independent schools. I did notice on the uh, delegate list, I got in advance a few HR people. You're very welcome to sit and listen and, and attend, but we're, we're talking uh, almost entirely about uh, student visas uh, in, in the session this morning. So you might find that the uh, uh, content isn't necessarily relevant to you if, if uh, all you really are interested in is skilled workers, uh, charity workers and, and, and right to work checks. Um, so I'm not really covering covering any of that, that stuff this morning. But maybe we'll do in the future if, if, there's, uh, if there's interest. All right. So uh, We'll start by looking at uh, recent and uh, what changes we expect to be coming up in the next year or so as far as uh, uh, student and child student uh, visa sponsorship for schools uh, is, is concerned. I'm then going to, uh, I've, I've then got some slides on uh, with, with a bit of an overview of uh, the issues around student visa compliance in schools. Uh, but uh, having a bit of a run through of my slides uh, early this morning, I might have to sacrifice some of that content because otherwise I might not get to the end uh, within the hour. Um, but the slides are there if you want to review them uh, at, a, at, a, at a later date. Um, I then want to spend a little bit of time just focusing on safeguarding and parental consent issues because those are a couple of issues that we seem to have had quite a, a sort of greater volume of questions about over the last uh, uh, six to 12 months. So um, I just wanted to uh, flag a few issues there for you all this morning. Um, uh, then we'll look at the annual sponsorship activities, uh, requests for CARES, um, uh, applications for the basic compliance assessment. Um, and then uh, we will finish up with uh, what I hope will be 10 useful questions for you to take away uh, and just do yourselves a little sort of self audit, think about whether there are any compliance uh, issues that you might be, uh, might, might be overlooking. Um, before we crack on, I always like to uh, get a sort of sense for uh, the sort of uh, volumes that the schools who are attending these sessions are, are, are dealing with. So our first poll, fingers crossed this one works because Zoom polls is one of the issues we were having with just as we were uh, getting started this morning. Uh, our first poll this morning, how many CAS does your school assign uh, every year? Uh, I'm waiting for the poll. Uh, to pop up. Uh, 
I have a suspicion that Tamar is having difficulty doing that. Nothing's arriving just yet. No, I think we're having a bit of a problem with our Zoom polls this morning. That's a shame. Um, that being the case, uh, let's uh, let's let's move on. Um, anyway, okay. So, what has changed uh, as far as uh, uh, the uh, environment within which we operate over the last uh, 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 few months is concerned? Well, the big announcement from an immigration policy perspective um, uh, 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 during the last year doesn't really affect our sector a great deal. Um, the, the background is that the uh, government and the uh, former Secretary of State for the Home Department in particular, uh, Suella Bravman, uh, were getting particularly concerned about um, uh, the net migration figures. Um, actually, we're due the next um, uh, uh, pub the publication of the next, next round of uh, migration statistics, either today or tomorrow, I suspect. Um, and uh, no doubt figures will have gone up again and, and the government will, will uh, uh, knee-jerk themselves into action um, uh, and announce another raft of measures to try and curb net migration. When this happened um, uh, back in May, um, the uh, uh, Home, Home Secretary decided to focus on student visas um, and announced a series of reforms, um, but as said, Mostly those will affect uh, higher education. So um, the particular uh, changes that have been introduced um, uh, are, are that uh, it's now much harder to switch out of the student category into a work-based immigration category. You need to have completed your, your degree. Um, and uh, or, or, you know, it's already the case that, that students and child students attending um, independent schools can't bring any dependents with them and, and, and nor would they need to uh, uh, but it's now much harder for uh, or from the 1st of January it would be much harder for a uh, student at a university to bring uh, their dependent family with them and that's that's likely to have an effect on the number of people interested uh, in, in coming to attend those uh, study on those courses and um, what might at uh, at some point in the future affects our sector is that the Home Office have promised to clamp down on unscrupulous international student agents who may be supporting inappropriate applications. Very, very hard to know what that is going to look like without any detail, whether it requires some sort of um, registration scheme for agents uh, as they have in other countries. Uh, very, very hard to know. Um, but certainly we're aware that the Home Office are asking uh, more detailed and, and uh, more regularly about the agents that schools and other education providers work with. So we can, at least in the short term, expect uh, that, that to remain to be the case. And I suspect that most of you will have received, again, in the last sort of couple of months, uh, requests from the Home Office for an update of the of the agents that you're working with, and we'll talk a bit a bit, a bit about agents uh, a, a bit later on in the session. Um, the other thing that uh, the Home Secretary promised was a review of the maintenance requirements for um, for, for for students, um, and what that might mean is a requirement for um, uh, additional funds to be made available. Uh, when making uh, the student or child student visa application. But again, no changes have been made on that front. Uh, watch, watch this space. The big thing that's coming up um, and which is something that this time next year, I suspect I and quite a number of others, probably quite a few of you on this call, are going to be tearing our hair out over, is the uh, impending... Uh, uh, cancellation, or, cancellation or, or, or termination of all biometric residence permits um, uh, to be replaced with a, a digital only immigration system. Um, uh, uh, so you, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the observant amongst you will have noticed that um, uh, for a number of years now, uh, any visa that's granted with an expiry date after the 31st of December 2024 
uh, will be uh, uh, evidenced on a BRP that itself expires on, on that date, 31st of December 2024. And the reason for that is that the Home Office had for a number of years now had this plan to move to an immigration system that is, to use their expression, digital by default, and will not be evidenced through uh, any any physical physical documents. So at some point in the next uh, few months, the Home Office have said that they will start issuing communications to people who hold BRPs, which are due to expire uh, on or after that, uh, uh, sorry, with, with visas, with, with, with immigration permission that's due to expire after that date. Um, on, and they will have they will be receiving instructions on how they can uh, um, set themselves up with an with an e visa, a, a digital immigration status, that they can then share um, uh, and access for them for themselves. Um, so uh, I dare say those of you uh, working in admissions, working with, um, with 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 your overseas pupils might well be uh, having to get involved in helping those 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 kids with with those uh, uh, setting up those accounts and making sure they can access access their status. Um, I don't think that the Home Office are going to be writing to everybody individually. I think this is going to come in the form of announcements on gov.uk. Um, and so we'll try and publicise that as widely as we can when when, when we know more. But uh, do, do keep an eye out for yourselves for any announcements that might come from uh, from 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 UKVI, um, as a, a, sort of a key part of the move over to this digital system will be the introduction of uh, of the ETA, the electronic electronic travel authorization scheme. Uh, that will be uh, something that that everybody travelling to the UK has to have. If they don't have a visa, they will need to have an, an an ETA. So that this will be something that will apply to. US nationals, EU nationals, people from Japan, Australia, countries which don't currently need anything other than their passport to come to the UK as a visitor will in the future need an ETA. And the reason for that is that uh, what the, the, they, they want everybody um, to have uh, some form of digital status, be it a digital visa or, a, or, or an ETA. And then the airlines will be checking everybody when they when they check them in to make sure they've got that before they uh, can travel. So over the next, <clears throat> so we've got this sort of pilot ETA scheme going on at the moment, um, and uh, it's currently just available to Qatari nationals being rolled out to further Gulf uh, states uh, in in February, and that's really just to sort of test that the technology works so that airlines can see this data. Um, uh, as people are uh, traveling, traveling in, traveling over to the UK. So, the idea is that by the end of next year, the US, Australia will also be part of that scheme. But um, there are uh, quite a number of people who uh, are skeptical about whether those timescales are realistic. Uh, you can guess for yourselves whether I'm one of those skeptics or not. Um, so moving, moving away from that, um, just a little update to give you. So um, a couple of months ago, um, I was very fortunate to be invited, along with some other immigration lawyers, to uh, a series of meetings that we had up in uh, Sheffield with uh, UKVI operations. And I just want to sort of pass on a few sort of points that we picked up uh, from, from, from those meetings, which included conversations with a couple of people from... Um, uh, uh, student compliance. Uh, so just to sort of highlight a few few points from that conversation that I think are of, 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 of interest. Um, they have recruited more compliance officers, the people who go out and carry out uh, compliance inspections of sponsors. Um, uh, so they're expecting uh, to, have, over the last year and, and in the forthcoming months, be, it be increasing the the volume of uh, of compliance inspections, and uh, you know certainly from the schools that we we speak to, um, I'm aware of quite a uh, certainly an, an increased number of uh, inspections over recent inspections over recent recent months. So that that's certainly borne out by what what we're being told told there. Things that they're looking out for uh, as far as student visa applications, and most most of these are probably things which affect sort of older students um, and those coming. Uh, <clears throat> for FE, HE courses rather than schools, but um, they believe that there's been an increase in, in fraudulent financial documents being used, particularly from some countries. Ghana was one that was, was mentioned to us, so those of you with 
um, students coming from Ghana might just need to think about that, where um, uh, 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 they're being required to provide um, evidence of their finances with their visa applications. They've seen an increase in students claiming asylum. The, the country that was mentioned to us in passing was Bangladesh. I mean, actually, we've, we've sort of heard from schools where there's been increases in asylum claims from a variety of countries, I Iran being one. Um, the significant point there is that um, UKVI was saying that um, where a student has come into the UK and then claimed asylum, they would view that student as as non genuine. Um, and if there's a sort of you know a, a large proportion of your students doing that, that that might be something which prompts them to take a closer look at your recruitment processes, um, which is very frustrating because it's very difficult to know you know predict whether someone's going to going to claim asylum and, and and what it's almost pushing us towards is sort of saying well let's not take any students from uh countries where people might have uh, feel that they have an, have an asylum claim which obviously isn't isn't a route that we want to be going down um so uh yeah qu quite a frustrating one but i suppose just something to sort of to to, to, to bear in mind and it be something that you you are aware of is, ha is happening amongst your students might be worth just sort of thinking about where there's any steps you can do to sort of to, to, to reduce that. Um, uh, reported increase in students being stopped at the border due to concerns about their English language. Again, less of an issue, I think, for, 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 for child students. Um, uh, we're sort of encouraged to pass on the uh, 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 re requirement to report agents um, um, using the spreadsheet that the Home Office have sent. Um, and you know, one of the things I mentioned in the context of agents was were, were, were concerns about some um, providers being being overly reliant on a small number of agents, um, uh, and you know that, necess that isn't necessarily something that <clears throat> we um, you know is is indicative of of anything uh, you know fraudulent or uh, uh, nefarious going on, but. Um, it might mean that it, it gives them cause to sort of to, to, to ask you some questions. Um, and, you know, something that we raised because it's something that always comes up in sort of uh, uh, September uh, are the issues about those students who uh, have arrived in the UK before their visa is valid uh, and then had their visa uh, uh, come into validity, either because it's approved after they've arrived in the UK or or because they've entered the UK before the valid from date on their on, on their visa. Technically, those students have entered the UK as, as visitors. Um, UKVI operations, who are separate from their policy colleagues, are trying to get policy to tell them how best to deal with those scenarios. Uh, at the moment, the advice remains uh, they need to leave the UK and come back in, uh, which is obviously very frustrating for all concerned, um, but maybe just maybe we might get some policy uh, on that, which helps, it's slightly more practical uh, uh, and, and gives us a bit more clarity uh, for the for the future. Um, other things, um, uh, many of you might have received an email from us re recently um, flagging a few uh, other issues in relation to um, students and child student sponsorship. Um, just to go through those very quickly, um, the sponsor management system now requires you to add the national insurance numbers of your authorising officer and key contact uh, through the uh, SMS. So if you've not done that, uh, do, do make sure that their national insurance numbers are on there. Um, you're also required to add the uh, school's company's house reference number to the sponsor management system if if it has one um so, some of you might be from schools which are uh, unincorporated charities for example in which case uh, you won't have a company's house reference number but some of you will do um uh, many many of you will do in fact and 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 so if that's the case you're required to add that reference number to the sms why don't really know we think it's to sort of future proof um um uh, sort of or, or to build in capacity to be able to automate some background checks uh, that they currently do manually. So we know that from time to time they'll go onto the onto company's house and see if there's been a change of ownership for a sponsor, for example, um, which should have been reported and in some circumstances might require 
a new license application to be submitted. Um, so we suspect that maybe it's to try and automate those sorts of things. But for now, it is one of those things you're being asked to do uh, 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 without really questioning. Um, <clears throat> some of you uh, will have heard of the study sector support um, service that has been launched by UKVI. Um, the, the background to this fairly interesting that the that, that, that UKVI used to offer a, a premium customer service uh, uh, facility for uh, student sponsors, which cost £8,000 per year. Quite low take up of that. Um, and um, uh, the government were criticised about uh, you know, the, the, the level of the fee and, and, and why these sorts of services weren't being made available more widely to the uh, education sector, given its importance to, uh, to, to, to the economy. And so uh, the premium service is now, be, is, is now no more. And instead, we've got this study sector support, which is available to all of you. Everybody who holds a student or child student sponsor license can access this study sector support principally through what's referred to as the account management portal, which allows you to post questions about um, uh, errors with uh, it BRPs or, or e-visas. You can ask questions about applicants' immigration history, uh, questions about CASIs, uh, and there's, there's telephone support for emergencies involving sponsored students. So there's, there's quite a number of services. F further information on, on gov.uk. Um, and you know, I'd, I'd urge you all to, to register for that. It's, it's a pretty good facility uh, for those questions that you're comfortable raising with the Home Office, for those where you maybe would prefer not to uh, uh, um, uh, ask them a question because you think it might uh, get you into trouble. Uh, hello, we're still here. Um, and then the other thing which has come into force uh, in the last month or so have been increases in the a student visa application fees. So a student visa uh, or a child student visa application which is submitted overseas will now cost the applicant £490. If they want to pay for priority service, the fee is increased from 250 to £500. And then in January, uh, probably towards the end of January, we think about the 16th, um, the immigration health surcharge is increasing to £776 per year. Um, so quite a significant increase there. And so for those students coming for sort of longer courses, that's going to be a significant amount of money they'll have to pay uh, for their uh, applications. Right, we're 25 minutes in and I'm about or a quarter of the way through my slides. So I'm going to skip over these next few slides, uh, which are sort of a bit of an overview of um, the issues around um, uh, uh, student compliance, student sponsor compliance. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you will get copies of these slides uh, uh, in the next few days, plus, plus a recording. Um, hopefully the content of these slides is fairly self-explanatory. So do feel free to sort of read through those. If there's any questions arising, then do uh, do, do, do let us know. Um, so yeah, just, just some things to think about uh, as far as those are concerned. Um, I wanted to spend a bit more time talking about uh, safeguarding and as I said, parental consent. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm skipping, skipping to those, those points now. Um, those of you familiar with the student sponsor guidance will be, will be aware of that for a couple of years now, there's, there's been this um, uh, section within the sponsor guidance, which, which uh, refers to specific child safeguarding duties and uh, requires uh, sponsors under the child student route to ensure that they have appropriate policies and procedures in place which ensure the safety, well-being and protection from exploitation of the children which it sponsors. And this, this, the, the, these provisions were introduced following um, uh, some, some press uh, around um, children who'd been, who had been trafficked into the UK. Um, you, you know, under the guise of coming to the UK um, with child student visas sponsored by independent schools, um, and then those 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 children promptly disappearing. So some some quite sort of nasty nasty business, and uh, understandably uh, quite a bit of concern 
uh, ar arising from that. And while the Home Office, uh, and as far as we're aware, no, nobody was, uh, none of the schools involved uh, were sanctioned, nobody lost their license, and the Home Office said that, you know, that, that they hadn't actually done anything wrong. Um, I think there was a feeling that they needed something in the sponsor guidance, which which referred to uh, the this, uh, you know, the, the, uh, sort of exploitation trafficking as being a possibility and encouraging schools which hold a sponsor license to um, just be alive to the possibility of these uh, of, of, uh, of, of this sort of thing uh, uh, arising. So um, it is worth revisiting your uh, safeguarding policies, your uh, missing children policies, uh, or maybe even considering having a sort of standalone policy which, which deals with uh, safeguarding um, for international students. Um, and just this on this slide, we've just got a few few thoughts on the sorts of things which um, that might uh, uh, w w that might cover. Um, so just a, a recognition of the possibility that somebody might try and exploit the fact that you have a license for getting children to the UK who who, who they are then intending to sort of uh, uh, exploit in, in in one way or another. Um, so do think about you know where inquiries are coming from if you're working with uh, agents if agents are introducing uh, uh, children to you um, do make sure that you're sort of doing appropriate background checks or that they're otherwise agents that you've been working with a long time and are, are sort of they're, therefore therefore trusted um, uh, thinking more widely about the vulnerabilities of children who are in a different country or or, or culture maybe speaking a different language, don't have any immediate family or close family uh, in, in, in the vicinity. Um, so, you know, perhaps more vulnerable to being exploited following their arrival in the UK if, if, if there were no sort of issues with them coming to the UK in the first place. Um, if you don't already, um, uh, for, for boarding schools, I would, I would suggest you have an educational guardianship policy in place um, to either require uh, an appointed educational guardian or, or at least some other person in the UK who can act as uh, uh, step into the shoes of the parents um, uh, where, where they're not they're not available and that policy would sort of set certain standards for the guardians maybe require them to be accredited in one form or another uh, uh, ensure that they're not you know an 18 year old living in a halls of residence for example that that that, that sort of thing. Um, and, and the other thing which, you know, is probably sensible for, for any form of safeguarding is, is to have a, a sort of encourage a culture whereby anybody could raise concerns. Um, the sort of e example I sort of flag was a case we were dealing with around a, a year ago or so where some students were introduced to, uh, to, to the school at pretty short notice. Some red flags were, were, were raised by the um, admissions team, but because they'd been introduced quite late on in the process and uh, the uh, marketing team were quite keen to sort of get them in because they were a bit down on their numbers, um, sort of decided to, to push ahead anyway. And, and, and those, those kids came into the UK and promptly, it, with, they came in with, with parents under the parent of a child student visa, but then they all promptly claimed, claimed asylum. And uh, there were certainly concerns that maybe they shouldn't have uh, being quite so hasty to admit them under those sorts of circumstances. And, and there were people within the school who were concerned, but didn't feel they were able to raise it because there was this sort of desperation uh, to uh, in increase numbers. Um, so uh, maybe that sort of thing that, that, that would be, be reflected in a, in a, in a, in a policy. Um, just some further thoughts on uh, work, working with agents. As I've sort of said a few times already, you are required by UKVI to uh, provide the details of the agents that you're working with and the sponsor guidance makes it clear that where um, uh, you're associated with agents who've been linked to abuse, then 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 that can lead to CAS requests being curtailed or refused uh, or, or other uh, sanctions being being taken against against you. Um, just on a sort of very purely commercial uh, uh, note, just you know, think about whether you're actually getting your money's worth from the agents. A lot of the time, they're attracting very, very large uh, fees, uh, very large proportion of the fees that, that students pay to you. Um, are, are they helping out with the student visa applications? Are they helping with 
uh, invigilating uh, entrance exams, those sorts of things. Um, so that was certainly something that our, our my commercial colleagues would, would would encourage you to think about. Um, think about whether you need to be conducting due diligence on on new agents, uh, and then you know, as a sort of without labouring the point, uh, watch out for signs of of, of, of trafficking. Is is the approach, uh, as in the example I gave a few moments ago, is it is it perhaps something that's too good too good to be true? Is the agent trying to get you to sort of uh, 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 forego your, your perhaps some of your usual admissions processes, uh, you know, and, and desperate for the CAS uh, that will support the students' visa applications. Um, and again, something that my my commercial colleagues would encourage me to say to you is, is that you, if you are working with agents, you should make sure you have a formal agreement in place. Uh, and wouldn't you know, we happen to have a template uh, agency agreement that. Uh, my colleagues would be very happy to uh, speak speak to you about, um, and uh, it may not surprise you to learn that uh, we have a number of of policies that uh, we we can make available to independent schools uh, to ad address a number of these points uh, and and others that 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 uh, uh, relates to uh, your child student visa license uh, policies governing right to study checks. Uh, uh, We've, we've developed a sort of template standalone safeguarding of an overseas pupils policy. Uh, there's an operations manual which we can work with you. That's sort of one that involves quite a bit of a isn't just an off the shelf thing. It, it's very much tailored for uh, for your particular uh, 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 policies and processes. Um, educational guardianship policy I've already mentioned. Um, uh, agents uh, agreement. Um, and we also have a series of uh, uh, internal audit checklists uh, that uh, might, might, might be of help if you want to review uh, your own uh, processes. Um, on the topic of uh, parental consent, this is again something which we've seen come up uh, a fair bit over the last, uh, certainly within this most recent admissions cycle. Um, and um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight a few things here. Um, the, the first is that um, you are required by the sponsor guidance to uh, ensure that you have uh, parental consent on your sponsored students' files. Um, that will come in the form, or as far as UKVI are concerned, that will come in the form of uh, the parental consent letter that has to be submitted with the child student visa application. That's a letter which is signed by um, in most cases, both parents um, and consents to the visa application itself, plus the arrangements made for the child's travel, care and uh, reception in the UK. Um, so that's been the case for quite a number of years. And, and you know, those schools that we speak to regularly are sort of well aware of that requirement. Uh, and every now and then we speak to a new school and they're not aware of that requirement. Uh, normally that conversation happens after the Home Office have been to visit them and said, where's the parental consent letter? Um, uh, the, as I said, the consent would normally come from, from, from both parents and the immigration rules uh, specify quite tightly the scenarios in which you wouldn't have both parents uh, signing that letter. And this is the sort of the, the issue that we've seen arise a bit more in the last uh, six months or so. So the only circumstances in which you'd only have one signature on that letter would be where the child has, instead of parents, has, has, a, has a legal guardian uh, instead, or where um, there's only one parent on the scene and they're deemed to have sole responsibility. Now, that can be quite easy if you know, we're in the unfortunate situation where one of the parents has died. But in the situation where the parents have split up, um, the question of whether that 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 the, the parent who cares for the children has sole responsibility is will always be very uh, fact specific, and um, uh, would generally, as the very final bullet point says, probably something which needs to be investigated by UKVI, and would often lead to uh, delays in the visa application being 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 processed. As it says on the slide, sole responsibility is not the same as sole custody. Um, and there's a there's a there's a test within uh, UKVI's guidance, um, and it it's sort of set out on on the slide there. 
either the parent is 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 unknown, sort of completely completely disappeared, or they have abdicated or abandoned their parental responsibility, um, and the other parent is exercising sole control in 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 uh, setting and providing the day to day direction and care for the child's welfare. Um, so you know, if you had a court order uh, granting sole custody, for example, to uh, one parent, but within that court order, it says that the other chair, other parent needs to be involved in decisions about schooling, uh, for example, then UKVI would see that as an example where that, that parent doesn't have sole responsibility because the, the other parent, while they're not involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, um, provision of care, they are still involved in in the direction of their uh, of, of their education and other important questions in their in their lives. So, um, d don't just accept what the re one remaining parent tells you at face value. Uh, if they have documents like court documents, do make sure you read them carefully. Um, and uh, this does seem to be something which UKVI have been focusing on and 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 looking at. Uh, in in far greater detail, um, and not just within uh, the context of child student visa applications, it's across all applications. So any app, all all, all immigration categories uh, where children um, children you know children are applying, um, uh, that there, there does seem to be this greater level of scrutiny which is being applied uh, by by UKVI in deciding those applications. Someone just popped a question in the chat asking whether we need evidence of a parent's death, for example, a death certificate. And I, I would say yes. Um, you know, I think you should be you should be asking for that level of of detail uh, before assigning the CAS and 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 to make sure that that they're going to be able to satisfy those requirements when the visa application is is submitted. So that's a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I would I'd be asking for that. And where the documents aren't in English, you're going to need translations. Um, just some other safeguarding uh, c considerations. Uh, just I'll, I'll try and rattle through these fairly quickly so we can we, we can uh, so get on to some some other content. Um, just in terms of, of uh, day pupils, um, those of you coming out on our sort of longer, more in-depth training on uh, um, child student visa sponsorship um, will be aware that we, we talk in some depth about the uh, very prescriptive um, categories for care arrangements of, uh, of, of, of day pupils. Um, and you need to ensure that uh, when you're sponsoring a day pupil that, that that the uh, child will be living in one of those approved arrangements and complying with the requirements of those arrangements. One of those arrangements is where uh, there's a parent coming to the UK with the child um, and that parent has been granted a parent of a child student visa. That visa is only available while the parent has a child under the age of 12 who's attending a, an independent school as a day pupil. Um, in, in the UK, I should, I should just just to be completely uh, uh, accurate. Um, and so it's never too, you know, I always say it's never too early to start the conversation about what the arrangements are going to be um, after that, uh, uh, after after the child uh, who's coming to your school turns 12, because the parent might not be able to have that visa anymore. And if you're an all through school, then you need to start thinking about what, what those care arrangements are going to be after that child's 12th birthday if you're a prep school up to end of year six then obviously that's not really much of a consideration but if you're a, a middle school or or, or a uh, uh, or an all through school then uh, yeah that is something that you you should be thinking about probably at admissions um for borders um um for for borders i do think about what the care arrangements are going to be uh in uh, exiats half terms and what have you Generally speaking, the arrangements for um, borders when making the visa application are more straightforward, but uh, it's where we seem to get trickier questions from UKVI um, uh, uh, during a compliance inspection, um, because they will be asking about what care arrangements are in place during exiats. Do you have a record of where they were? Uh, what arrangements were made for collecting them? Uh, uh, from their return to school. Um, if they have an educational guardian, then, then the educational guardian can, can sort of be confirming those, those details with you. But maybe 
for one exiat they decide not to um stay with the educational guardian they're going to go and stay with a with a with a friend from school um have we got consent uh for for, for that that change um uh and i'm getting a few questions about this let's see if we could quickly uh, uh mop up some of those flexi boarding um so um the immigration rules don't define boarding as they see it you're either a boarder or a, or a day pupil um so what about week, weekly boarding what about flexi boarding um for the sake of having to advise on this the definition that i have which i you know isn't really based on anything other than uh it seems like a sensible uh uh, uh, uh um sensible way to, to 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 define it is if you're spending more time in the care of the school uh so four nights a week or more uh, at the school then you're a boarder uh, uh, less than that then you're a day pupil um question is if you're a flexi boarder is the parent allowed to get a parent of a child student visa um the answer is, is it well it, it will depend on whether the child is a day pupil or a or, or a boarder and, and sort of if flexi is three days a week then they're probably a day pupil in which case they, they the parent could potentially accompany them um but if they're if they're if they're a boarder then uh the parent can't isn't isn't eligible for that visa um, and I'm aware of scenarios in which parents are granted that visa where their child is here as a boarder. Um, that may be because they've got a, another sibling who's attending a day school, uh, or it might be just that UKVI made an error, uh, which does happen from time to time. Um, uh, and uh, you know they, they really shouldn't have been granted that uh, that, that visa. Um, someone's asking, can a parent on a student visa be the guardian for their own child? If the child is coming on a child student visa, um, there, there's there's nothing within the sponsor guidance, nothing within the immigration rules which sets this out. I mean, in fact, where, where, for for boarding pupils, um, the uh, references uh, to educational guardians in the sponsor guidance uh, number precisely zero. There's there's no reference to educational guardians, so it's something that the school will have to define for itself. But I think this comes under your sort of you, you know, and this is why it's important to have a policy. This comes under, you know, whether you think that the care arrangements that are being made for the child are suitable. Do you think it is suitable for a child who is, you know, to all intents and purposes under your care to be staying with a student uh, during exiat's half terms? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. What if the student's living in halls of residence? Almost certainly not. Shared flats with some other friends? Probably not. I mean, it a lot of schools will you know will 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 include their own standards for who can be that guardian and they'll they'll, they'll, they'll impose requirements like having a minimum age uh, and 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 that sort of thing so it will be one that you need to sort of decide for yourselves but do think very carefully about you know i suppose the way to think about it would you be happy for your child to be uh, uh staying with uh staying in a particular scenario um Another question, uh, if parents have not yet indicated plans beyond 12th birthday, what should the advice be? Should they leave the UK and return once new visa secured? Um, I think I, I think if you haven't had that conversation and the child's 12th birthday is coming up, then you need to have that com conversation. Um, it will very much depend on what, um, uh, what, what options are available. If you're a boarding school and there's a, there's a place in the boarding house, uh, then... Um, on their 12th birthday, they should be moving into the boarding house because the, uh, the, the, the the parent won't be able to remain in the UK caring. It might be that there's a younger sibling and so they will still have eligibility for that visa beyond your pupil's uh, 12th birthday, provided that young, younger sibling's attending a school as a day pupil. Um, but, um, you know, it, it will be fact specific. Otherwise, if you're a day school only, you need to be looking at private foster caring or whether there's another close relative in the UK who's got British citizenship or is otherwise settled here who can act as the carer. So it, it, it will depend on the particular circumstances. Um, we're very quickly running out of time just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the 
annual activities uh, that uh, you, you're required to do as a sponsor. The first is the request for uh, uh, the your CAS allocation. Um, just to flag those of you who aren't already aware, um, UKVI will, in looking at your request, also look at uh, the Get Information About Schools page on gov.uk. And uh, if your school uh, if, if, if your school's entry on that website is showing uh, that you're over capacity, then they're probably going to say, well, how can you possibly fit in any more pupils, uh, uh, get that resolved, and then we can uh, consider your CAS request. They'll also maybe write back to you and ask further questions if your capacity is very close to being reached. Uh, and you're asking for, I don't know, 50 CASs. Um, so uh, uh, do think about whether that capacity number on get information about schools is 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 correct uh, if it needs to be increased then that's generally a material change request that needs to be made through uh, the dfe so um something to speak to uh, uh, uh sp speak with with colleagues in the school about uh, getting getting that resolved because otherwise it's going to affect your uh, your 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 cas uh, allocation request. Um, if you're asking for more CAS, then that can also lead to queries. They, they will consider requests for additional CAS, but um, uh, if you're asking for a significant number, then it, it may well come with um, uh, some additional questions. Um, also worth flagging, just in relation to the, sort of the, the, the CAS allocation, that if you fail uh, a compliance inspection uh, from your inspector at ISI or Ofsted, uh, then that's reportable to the Home Office and uh, they will then zero your CAS allocation. Um, any CAS assigned prior to that point can, can be used though, uh, but you're not going to get reinstated, your CAS allocation reinstated until you've uh, met all of the required standards. The other annual activity is the basic compliance assessment. Um, uh, um, uh, hopefully you're all sort of f familiar with the requirement to submit that request and pay the fee for the privilege uh, on, on an annual basis. Uh, the slide sets out um, what those standards are. Just say a couple of things about the, the enrolment rate and the course completion rate aren't normally things that we see there being issues with um, as far as uh, uh, independent schools are concerned. Course completion can sometimes look a bit alarming, you know, students do leave and move to other schools or, or, or for personal reasons have to leave the UK and return home. Um, but that calculation doesn't include pupils who've um, deferred and left the course or left the UK uh, and left the UK uh, or indeed switch schools or immigration category. So the key message there is to make sure you keep a record of, uh, of, of, uh, of what's happened so that you can update UKVI and tell them that they, the student who they have counting against you on the course completion metric actually shouldn't be counted against you because they've moved to another school, for, for, for example. On visa refusals, um, again, one that feels quite out of our control, but there are some steps that we can take. Um, uh, students who are going to have to show a certain amount of money available when submitting their visa application, um, then uh, you know, maybe thinking about if, if they're a boarding pupil, uh, getting a full year's fees in advance so they don't have to show any money is being available. Think about issuing visa guidance and, and templates uh, for, for, for parents. So there are some steps we can take. Um, and as part of our sort of due diligence on students, hopefully we'd, we'd sort of establish whether there's likely to be any, any issues uh, or, or not. Um, I have another poll at this juncture, but I fear it's not going to work uh it is not so um i'm just asking yeah you know, we're just asking sort of what sort of support you're you're providing for parents and students with the visa, visa applications which was to lead us on to i'm afraid a little bit of a sales pitch and um, this is for a, a product that we've been working on over the last couple of years with uh, uh a company called ITQ Metis who provide other software packages for independent schools. It's a, it's a partnership we've entered into with them whereby they're developing the software platform. We're, we're providing the content. And Immigration Manager is a, is a, is a portal for um, schools and parents to be guided through the sort of CAS assignments and uh, visa application process with, with the aim really of, of reducing those issues and hopefully making that, that process smoother 
for, for all, all concerned. There's um, some uh, notes on the slide here about the sort of various features and, 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 and benefits uh, of the product. Briefly, how it works is that uh, the, the school and the parents have access to a portal. It's the, it's the school's portal. You give the parents access. They complete a questionnaire uh, on, on behalf of their child. Um, in so doing, that flags any issues for the school to be aware of in terms of potential issues with the application uh, or uh, missing documents. When you're happy, then that enables you to uh, assign the CAS um, and then uh, immigration manager automatically prepares a visa, visa guidance pack for the family to guide them through the visa application process, enabling the student to uh, uh, make the application. Um, and uh, all the while, uh, the, the, the progress is tracked on immigration manager, and you're able to sort of see see what their what their what their what their progress is. Um, we have a poll <laughs> asking if you'd like to find out more. We can get um, uh, somebody to, to provide you with a demo um, uh, and uh, take you through the details of how it works in, in more detail. Polls aren't working. Do uh, hmm, maybe pop something in the chat or feel free to send me uh, an email afterwards. My details will be on the very final slide. If it is something that you're interested in, um, and we can we can we can follow up with you. Um, so if that is something that you'd like to hear more about, uh, do do let us know uh, one way or another. We were going to give you a poll so that you could do that very very easily, but Zoom is against me this morning. Okay, before we sort of round up, some final questions uh, from from you. I've just got some questions for you, um, and and again, maybe in the interest of getting to some of your questions, I'm not going to deal with all of these uh, right now live, but when you get the slides, you can maybe review these and have a think about whether uh, any of them give you any 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 cause for concern. So um, uh, you know, question one we've, we've already talked about in terms of care arrangements. Are you assigning a single CAS which covers both GCSEs and A-levels? Uh, because you shouldn't be. The sponsor guidance says that you shouldn't. Um, do you have parental consent letters on file? Have you notified UKVI of the agency you're working with? Um, where sponsor guide sponsor pupils have left the school before the course end date? Has that been reported? We talked very briefly earlier about UKVI focusing on uh, things that, uh, on, on reporting due duties during compliance inspections. Um, sponsor pupils transferring to you from another school. Uh, is your process to ensure they've applied for a new child student visa before commencing their studies? Because that's a requirement. Um, how do we check and monitor the status of non-sponsored overseas pupils? Uh, in other words, are we conducting right to study checks? Uh, are any students here as visitors? Um, there is some limited study available to people who are visiting the UK, but uh, there are conditions attached, and so it's not sort of to be used as a workaround for someone who didn't get their child student visa in time. Um, is anybody sharing their SMS password? Please don't do that. Um, and um, does our license cover the worker and the student categories? Uh, I'll be confident that our colleagues in HR are complying with their duties. Um, so just as I say, just some questions for you to uh, uh, take, take away. Um, I did have another poll. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. There's my contact details. So if you do want to contact us about any additional support or immigration manager, uh, uh, then please feel free to drop me a line. And um, there are a few more questions uh, uh, that have been posted. Let me just see if I can deal with some of those. And if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to post them. Um, at the moment, I'm looking at both the Q&A box and the chat box. So if maybe you can pop them in the Q&A. That's probably a bit easier for me to manage all in one place. Um, if a student switches into your school from another independent school, can they port the IHS with them? Or have the parents lost that money paid and will have to pay again when applying for a new visa? So it's a bit of both, actually. So they have to pay the IHS again when applying for the new visa, but they should then get a refund of the unused IHS from the previous visa. So if they had a three-year visa previously, they move after two years, they should get 
a prorated refund of uh, equivalent to one year unused IHS because they've sort of oh, they, they've sort of overlapped that with their separate application. So they can't um, uh, reduce the amount they have to pay at the point where they need to apply for the visa to come to your school, uh, but uh, they should get a refund uh, at some point. Um, we're a London day school and have several questions about candidates who do not have UK passports. Will you be covering this or should I email you afterwards? I mean, I've sort of covered it a bit, but in the time available, I think you're probably going to have to email me uh, afterwards. Um, oh, these are candidates with parents who do not need a cat parents families who do not need a cas okay yes yeah, so so yeah i mean if 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 somebody's here on a visa um uh which is dependent on their parents then uh, you are required if you're a sponsor license holder then you are required to check that uh all students at the school have the right to study uh, or at least take steps to ensure that uh everybody uh, has 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 the right to study um uh you know, for for those who are parents, they don't need a. So, so for those who are here as a dependent with their parents, um, yeah, you you would you would just check the child's BRP or their digital status, and and that would be enough. You don't need to then assign them a CAS. They don't need a child student visa. Uh, that would be uh, everything. Um, uh, uh, that would be as far as the checks checks are concerned. Um, oh, a further questions come back on the on the point I was starting to answer earlier about. Uh, a, a student being a guardian. I'm talking about a parent student in their 30s living in a house with their child, a parent of an applicant for our school to receive a refusal letter for their visa application, which seems to be because the parent isn't deemed to be eligible to be the guardian as they don't have settled status in the UK. So if the child is a, um, a, a on a child, if the child's applying for a child student visa, um, and they're a day pupil, you're a day school, then the only approved living arrangements are if they're living with a, a close relative who must be someone who is settled in the UK, and there's a definition of close relative, <clears throat> or they can be living with a private foster carer who must be settled in the UK, uh, or they can live with a parent who holds a parent of a child student visa, uh, or, or um, otherwise, uh, if they're over 16, they can live independently uh, with their parents' consent or otherwise the only other option is to, is, is to board. Um, uh, if, if, if the uh, only person available to care for them is a parent, that parent holds their own student visa, that doesn't actually come in with, come within any of those five categories. Um, and the, the reason is because you can live with a close relative but the definition of close relative, weirdly, doesn't include parent. And also the close relative has to be someone who's settled in the UK and a parent who holds a student visa doesn't. I think that the reason that sort of policy has, has, has developed is because certainly in the past, the student, the parent student would be able to include the, uh, uh, the, the child on their visa as a dependent of their student visa. Now that's not always possible um particularly now with the reforms that we, we mentioned very briefly earlier to the uh student route uh, and the ability of students to bring dependents um so it might be that there are scenarios in which you know that 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 there isn't an approved living arrangement you've then got to think about whether there's somebody else who can be the the, the carer for that child so it will be um uh, 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 uh you know it will be very fact specific but hopefully that sort of just about answers the question. Um, I'm, Tom, you've mentioned that for non-sponsored students, we just need to check right to study for child. Are we required to check parents' passport and visa as well to assure child visa is okay? Um, that's a question we actually get quite a lot. Um, there's nothing that says, there's no guidance which tells you how to do a right to study check. Um, and um, Really, all we do need, you know, the, so we sort of left developing this sort of policy on the hoof a little bit. And um, really, um, the only um, uh, the only thing we're required to do is is to, is to take steps 
to make sure that the child has the right to study. And so the so bare minimum for that, for someone who's got a dependent visa would be to see a copy of, of their visa. There may be reasons for wanting to see the parents' visas as well. Um, if we want to, you know, if they're a day pupil, for example, and we want to make sure that the care arrangements that the child, uh, that will be in place for the child uh, 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 mirror the length of their visa, for example, it's not a bad idea. Um, but almost certainly the visas will be uh, of the same validity. So I suppose what I'd say is I wouldn't worry too much if you don't have copies of parents' visas, so long as you've got the child's. Um, but for the sake of completeness, uh, you know, there's no harm in asking for it at the same at the same time. Um, we're, we're over 11 o'clock. There's sort of one other question that's popped in, which I'm happy to answer. But otherwise, those of you who do have to log off, many thanks for attending. Um, contact details are on the on the on the screen there. Um, and, you know, we will be following up in the next uh, few days anyway, with copies of the slides are recording um, uh, requests for feedback. So uh, apologies, we weren't able to um, get that feedback from you during the session. But it's been uh, very, very good to see so many of you attending um, and hope to uh, hope to do something again uh, in the very near future. Um, but I'll just ask this, this answer this. Well, let me just see if there's any more questions. Oh, crikey. Yes, quite a few questions popping into the box now. Um, I'll just mop up a couple more questions and then and then and then we'll log off, given that it is after uh, 11 o'clock. Um, so uh, asking for imminent inspection, have all children visas. Oh, so OK, so someone's got an inspection coming up imminently. Uh, have. Uh, oh, we have all the child visas. I'm wondering if I need to chase uh, parents to be compliant. Um, I, I, I would I would say you're probably going to be going to be fine on that. I wouldn't, you know, stress that's probably sort of lower down on the uh, list of priorities. If there's other things that need to be resolved, I wouldn't be too worried about about doing that. Should we, we be should we be requesting birth certificates of prospective pupils to link parent with child? Uh, I would say yes, probably from a contractual point of view as, any, as much as anything else. But also when they make the visa application, they'll have to submit their their, their, their birth certificate. So you might as well ask for it at that point uh, as well. Um, uh, and one other, uh, interesting on right to study checks. We've been told we should keep parent passport on file, but we've been told by a couple of parents that under GDPR, they don't think we have the right to see their passport, not in relation to visas. This was for due diligence. Um, yes, I mean, the, the, the problem is that, you know, Obviously, with GDPR, you need something to hang your hat on, a reason why you're asking for a particular piece of information or, or data. Um, and the sponsor guidance doesn't really give us that. It just says we need to take steps to ensure that children have the right to study at the school. Um, so, yeah, you, 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 you probably are on slightly shaky ground as far as GDPR is concerned as a reason for requesting that. But you may have other reasons as well. As I said, you, you might need to request um you might need to request uh, uh, uh their, their birth certificate and then in seeing that you might also want to see a passport as further verification of relationship between an identity um um there may also be reasons i suppose for requ requesting proof of identity where uh, you're worried about sanctions for example and you want to sort of verify the identity of a parent because the money's coming from somebody from uh, a country which is potentially sanctioned so you want to verify the parent's identity and so a copy of their parent would help with that but that's really straying out of my field of expertise i have to say so i think on that note um let's let's draw the session um to, to a close um any other questions do do feel free to drop me a line um and uh, as i said we will be following up in the next few days with uh, a recording and copy of the slides thanks very much for attending